She wanted to live. She fought to survive. This is a case about self-defense. That's what this case is about. It's not about Ezra's relationships with other men. It's not about Jason Mango. It's not about the missing witness that you never heard from, John Hansen. It's not about whether she's posted racy photos of herself. It's not about all the drama going on at coffee shops in Eau Claire. This is about Ezra and Alex. What happened between those two people in the back seat of a car. A car stuck in the mud out in the middle of nowhere. This is a case about self-defense. Let's start with the fight in the car. Because I think the state has presented to you and I'll eventually address some of their arguments that they've gone through, right? But I think what is clear, and I want to go through the evidence with you, is clear. This is about a fight in the back seat, right? Let's just think of the evidence. State's theory is essentially this. After 15 days of trial, 19 months of investigation, 15 days of trial, their closing argument, they come up here and they tell you, she's lying. Just want to wipe it all away. That's what they want to say. As if he's Obi-Wan Kenobi talking to the droids in the first Star Wars and just says, ignore all this. You can wash it away with one hand. You can't do that in court. Especially when you don't bring anything else. At some point you're going to be shown the law. I'm going to talk to you about the law. The judge has already told you the law. But we'll remember from the first day that I spoke with you. If you can reconcile the evidence upon any reasonable hypotheses consistent with her innocence, you should do so. The state has not brought you any reasonable hypotheses whatsoever. And they certainly have not disproved, which is their burden, their burden to disprove beyond a reasonable doubt the reasonable hypotheses that I stood here on day one of the trial in Vordier and talked about, on day two of the trial in openings and talked about and presented to you and say, this is what happened. And then we call our witness, witnesses. Ezra gets up on the stand. And what do they bring in rebuttal to all of that evidence? Julia Post, a friend from high school and middle school, to say her personal opinion about another human being when she knows nothing at all about this case. That's what they do to rebut our reasonable hypotheses. But it starts with a fight in the back seat of the car. Here's the evidence that there was a fight in the back seat of the car, right? One is, she told that to Detective Proc on the 24th. And I understand the state says, don't believe that. Don't believe any of that. on day one and I talked about what happened here and the state has brought you no evidence to contradict anything that we say about what happened there they want to call Ezra and question your credibility about what happened in the months leading up to that they want to call her a faker or a liar based upon her mental condition after that have nothing to fill that in there. So I do present to you Ezra's statement. She told Investigator Proc 
19 months ago, there was a fight in the back seat of the car. What else do we know? Physical evidence. They talked about it. We put it up. He put it up on the screen. <coughs> Alex's blood is in the back seat of the car. It's in the back seat of the car. It's on the ground around the front of the car. Can I have the, the screen on, please? We know his blood is outside of the car, but we know his blood is inside of the car. It's in both places, right? So what we need to figure out is, logically, what can we conclude from that? We can conclude, like the state's trying to say is, there was a fight outside, and then he retreated into the car. Or they could, there could be, there was a fight inside, he got out, and then he got back into the car. Because we know at the end of the day, he's in the car. So where did it start? The fact that there's blood in the backseat of the car is consistent with the defense theory. There was a fight in the backseat of the car. And I can talk about where it is and why it is. But just because he was cut doesn't mean he's going to bleed profusely right away. There's no evidence that says he would be dripping. There's no evidence that says about the blood, how it would be spurting. What we know is his clothes were saturated. And we'll get to that eventually. There's a defect to the rear back seat of the car. Right? In exhibit 621, right there, as well as right there. There's defects to the back seat of the car. Reasonable hypotheses, those are from a knife, a puncture wound from a knife. There's no testimony that they were there before. There's no testimony that says they're not from a knife. There's a knife in the back seat of the car. There's a fight in the back seat of the car. Four. Well, I, th I think four is the one on the back seat of the driver's seat. Uh, three before is the one on the back seat uh, in general. The displaced hat, as you recall, you can see it from here. Up here, if you recall, there's a hat. It's on the back of the driver's side thing, and it's been displaced. It was as if somebody had originally took a hat and pulled it over like a skull cap over the top of the And then it got disrupted. Something happened to that hat. And if you recall, what she had both told Investigator Proc on the 24th and what she testified when she took the oath and talked to you is at some point she was pressed up against the back of that seat. Her head, her neck was pressed up against that headrest. That hat is consistent with what she says. There's a fight in the back seat of the car. The mud on the ceiling, right? We entered those pictures in at the close of our case. That's not something the state had done before. In Exhibit 709, you can see the mud on the ceiling in the back seat. It's documented again in 708. Exhibit 707 shows it with the sticker there. In Exhibit 710. testimony to Proc, or her statements to Investigator Proc, Detective Proc on the 24th is, she was kicking and kicking and kicking. Her testimony to you was, she was kicking in the backseat of the car. How do they explain that there's mud 
on the ceiling in the back seat of that car other than from a foot scrape from somebody kicking in a fight to survive. If you remember the shoes, her shoes were muddy. Her shoes were at the scene. They weren't muddy from her leaving the scene, they were at the scene. And we'll get into his shoes before, but his shoes don't have much mud on them. Because she said beforehand she got out, she was walking around the car, she was trying to move or trying to get the car out. She had mud on her shoes. She gets into the car, they get into a fight, she kicks and kicks and kicks to survive. There's a fight in the back seat. Her hair is in the footwell, right? She testified and she told Investigator Proc that at some point after he had put his hand up on her throat, he slid it around and pulled her hair out. And she said, I believe she said she screamed at that point. She said something at that point. There's hair on the bottom of that footwell, right where the hat was before, if you recall correctly. This picture here is the same footwell for this picture. That's on the bottom of that floor there, under the coat. Here's a picture of the coat. That hair is under that coat, which we'll get to later when we talk about the order of events. But remember that. Hair is on the bottom. On top of the hair are shoes. On top of that is a coat. On top of that is Alex. There was a fight in the back seat of the car in that footwell. He pulled out her hair. In the exhibit, when we heard from the uh, people from the crime lab, Kevin Scott, he tested that hair. And it was Ezra McCandless's hair. That's her hair in the footwell where the fight was. Alex's injury to his knee. I believe we spoke about that in opening. We spoke about that right from the beginning of the case. I told you, pay attention to the injury to his knee. There was something that happened to his knee and there's no explanation for how that could have happened other than his knee being on a hard surface rubbed against it. The bottom left hand corner there, if you can't see because of my, there's an abrasion. The state's medical examiner, Kelly Mills, testified. And Ms. Vishney asked her questions about that. She said, yes, that's an abrasion, and that occurred at the same time as the other injuries. That's what the state's expert said. And the state's expert also said, when they looked at the clothes, there was no mud on the knee right there. There's no mud. So how do you scrape your knee when you're wearing pants you do it on a hard surface. Where's the only hard surface that that could have happened where he wouldn't have got mud on it? The back seat of that car. That's consistent with a fight going on in the back seat. And if you recall, again, I said that in my opening. I brought that to you. In 15 days of witnesses, 45, 50 witnesses that the state called, two-hour closing argument, not once did they rebut or disprove that reasonable hypothesis. They brought you nothing. Number nine, the, the back door, right? The crime scene, the back door of the vehicle is open. I think as we can see in the other previous pictures, this door, now granted, that's at the crime lab, right? But I think we all recall that that door was open at the scene because we remember Mr. Woodworth's half in, half out of the car. How come that door is open? Somebody got in that door, right? But what we know is this, is when they tested the car, 
There is no blood on the door handle on the outside. Remember on the other, if you look at the one with the outside door handle with uh, number one pointed on it. So this is the outside of the car door. You recall there's this right here where there's the, the blood on the outside of that door, right? But what they didn't do is they didn't find blood on that door handle. They didn't find blood on that door handle. Here's the other side of the car. There's no blood on that door handle, and there's no blood on that door handle, which tells you this. Nobody opened that car door after there was bloodshed which means the door was open before there was bloodshed. It's the only reasonable explanation. And why would the door be open on that car in the back? Because two people were in the back seat of that car, and there was a fight in the back seat of that car. That evidence, or the lack of evidence, supports the reasonable hypothesis there is a fight in the back seat of that car, ladies and gentlemen. Now, you saw all these pictures, and you've seen me. I'm struggling to even find the pictures sometimes. There's just so many pictures, right? But there's no pictures of the ground that show a struggle being on outside. There's blood on the ground, right? There's definitely blood on the ground, but there is no pictures whatsoever. shoes, we've seen mud on pants, we've seen mud everywhere else. If there's a knife fight going on out in a muddy area out on that field, there'd be more mud on Alex's shoes. There'd be mud displaced all over in that area. Other than blood on the ground, which could come from a person who is cut walking and staggering around, there's no evidence of a struggle outside of that of that at all. Basically, the only evidence that they've got of a footprint nearby is what I'd asked. When I'd asked, I believe it was Deputy DeVries, and we talked about this footprint that he agreed was going in the direction towards the open door. Right? And that that was the last print. Because if it's still there, if somebody stepped on over it, right, we all just know logically if if that foot's put there, that's because nobody else stepped on it afterwards. The state's theory is he runs into there, and afterwards she's standing out there stabbing him, stabbing him, stabbing him from outside of the car and trying to drag his body back out. That footprint... is at marker 5, right there. And it's in a direction going into the car. Absence of any struggle, mud, scrapes, falls on that scene out there outside suggests that where the fight was wasn't outside. The fight was in the back seat of the car. Two more points. It simply rings true. Use your common sense. Two young people who had previously been sexual partners are in a car, the car stuck out in the mud on the middle of nowhere. They're in the back seat. It's not, not a crazy hypothesis. It's based upon common sense, right? It rings true. It started in the back seat. Last point, similar to the first point, is Ezra's testimony. 
she came in here, she talked to you. She took that stand, she took an oath, she told you it happened in the back seat. And I understand they're going to attack her. They have attacked her. They'll continue to attack her. They'll, they'll attack her sex. They'll attack her gender. They'll attack her anything. They'll attack any way that they can. But I submit to you this. She went through that on March 22nd. And you heard the tapes of her on that day afterwards. You heard her hysterical. You heard her in that trauma. And she got back up here again and told you what happened. There was a fight in the back seat of the car. I'm going to come back later and talk to you about why the state's theory makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense. It started in the back seat of the car. But I want to take a step back before I go back into some more facts and just let's talk about the law for a second, right? Because I think this entire case is very good that we need to frame it in a court of law. This isn't an argument down at Racy's. This isn't somebody sitting at the kitchen table with their parents gossiping about a case. This is a great duty that you've been selected to serve upon. And it's a big weight. I think the judge even says that in the, in the instructions later, that it falls upon you. But the good news is, is you have the law. And the law, as the judge said in the beginning, we live in the United States of America, the greatest country in the world. And oftentimes what many, many, many people say is the greatest country ever is because of our legal system. The rule of law, right? Don't want to go too far into history, but back in the 1700s, when this country was founded, it wasn't founded based upon a particular religion. It wasn't founded on a particular ethnicity. It wasn't founded on a race. It was founded by people who came here and they were mixed, right? If you lived in Pennsylvania, you were, came from a very different place from Europe than if you lived in Massachusetts, or if you lived in Delaware, or if you lived in Georgia. And of course, there were many people that didn't come here of their own free will. But what our country, when it was formed, it was formed on the law. They wanted to say, we want to make our own laws not a king, not a monarch, not anything along those lines, but followed on the law, voted upon by the people, and most importantly, the right to a jury trial, decided upon by a people. Three principles that govern that system. The presumption of innocence, the burden of proof, and proof beyond reasonable doubt. So let me talk to you a little bit about those. The instruction that the judge read to you, right? First thing, the defendants are not required to prove their innocence. The law presumes every person charged with the commission of an offense to be innocent. This presumption requires a finding of not guilty unless in your deliberations you find it is overcome by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that she is guilty. Those are long instructions. I remember back here at about 8.30 when the judge read those, and it was about, I don't know, 45 minutes or so of reading of those. I think there's like 20-plus pages. I submit to you, I should probably double-check, but I'm pretty sure that the only place that the word requires is found in those pages is that sentence. This presumption requires a finding of not guilty. 
That's for you. That's something that you get. She is presumed innocent. The second part of that is that the burden upon overcoming that is on the government. They have to bring evidence to you, as it says there. You've probably read it by now. The burden of establishing every fact necessary to constitute guilt is upon the state. The evidence, before you can return a verdict of guilty, the evidence must satisfy you beyond a reasonable doubt that she is guilty. We don't have to bring you anything. They have to overcome and bring it all to you. So if you, as you sit there, you have unanswered questions, you think, well, this doesn't make sense. It wasn't explained to me. Objection, Your Honor, that doesn't properly state the law. Sustain. Go ahead and continue. The law speaks for itself. Right? Later on when I talk about it, you can consider reasonable doubt. You can consider both the evidence and the lack of evidence. If they haven't brought it to you, it's because it doesn't exist. It's their burden to do that. The third part of the law that you should consider is what's that level of proof, right? In these cases, it's the highest level of proof that we have in the law, in the land. In civil cases, all right, if somebody's been wronged and they want to sue another individual, they want to, and the only way we can do that in the United States of America or any place for that matter is you sue them to get money, okay? In order to do that, the plaintiff has the burden to prove by what's called a uh, preponderance of evidence. And the best way to think about that. I like to think about it with the, these reams of paper here, all right? So if one side's got a ream of paper of evidence, and the other side has a ream of paper of evidence, and this is the plaintiff, they don't win. You can bring all of this, and you don't win, because this isn't any more than this. Make sense? But all they need to do in that scenario, all right? One side, another side. When it's the lowest burden of preponderance, they just need one sheet of paper. You put one sheet of paper on that side, and they've met their burden. There's a middle burden as well. In Wisconsin, it's called clear and convincing evidence. And that's in cases where if the government wants to take your child, right, or if there's other civil matters, they need to convince, bring a, proof, a level of proof that's called by clear, convincing, and satisfactory evidence. And it's a little muddled, certainly in my mind, but what does that mean? And a jury would need to decide that, but I would submit to you that in that situation, clear, convincing, and satisfactory would be when one side has twice as much as the other side. Makes sense to me. It's pretty clear that the burden has been met in that scenario. In this case, it's the highest burden of proof that's necessary. The state needs to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. The meaning of reasonable doubt, right? A doubt based upon reason and common sense. A doubt for which a reason can be given arising from a fair and rational consideration of the evidence or the lack of evidence. It means such a doubt as would call a person of ordinary prudence to pause or hesitate when called upon to act in the most important affairs of life. That's what reasonable doubt means. And you can read on. It also talks about what reasonable doubt isn't. But the line before that really is what changes it. And I've talked to you about that. If you can reconcile the evidence upon any reasonable hypotheses consistent with the defendant's innocence, you should do so and find her not guilty. So, in this situation, it's no longer one side have more than the other side. The plaintiff in a case like this, the state, stack as much as they want over on this side. 
Put it all up there. That's fine. But if you don't make reasonable doubt go away, it doesn't matter. They have to eliminate reasonable doubt. And from the get-go, I stood here, looked you in the eye and said, here's what our reasonable hypothesis is. Here's what happened. Prove beyond a reasonable doubt it didn't happen. And they haven't. They haven't brought you that evidence. And they haven't brought you that evidence because that evidence doesn't exist. If it did, I submit this whole group, prosecution team, certainly amongst this prosecution team, they'd have found it and they'd have brought it to you. But after 15 days, they haven't. And they haven't because it doesn't exist. And it doesn't exist because she's innocent. Right? That's what the law says. And in this case, it's about self-defense. So let me talk a little bit more about self-defense as well. This is a, I believe we all agree, a, a fair reading of the law on self-defense. I'm going to give you a second to read that while I take down this other one from distracting you. similar to that. Self-defense, when it's an issue, it allows her to threaten or intentionally use force only under certain situations, right? There's basically three parts to it, okay? First two are her beliefs. That's a subjective standard, right? Did she believe? That's what your first consideration is. Did she believe that there was an actual or imminent unlawful interference with her person. Second is, did she believe the amount of force she used or threatened to use was necessary to prevent or terminate that interference? And we're gonna talk about those. I'll go through the evidence that shows she had those two beliefs. If you find that she had those two beliefs, those two beliefs right away She's not guilty of first degree intentional homicide. They have to disprove, and this is where it gets into these double negatives, right? But they have to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that she did not have a belief that she was in actual or imminent, uh, there was going to be an actual or imminent unlawful interference with a person. They have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt she did not believe that. They have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt she did not believe the amount of force she used. If they haven't done that, right away she's not guilty of first degree intentional homicide. You don't even need to consider intent, which I'm going to get into here later. The third part of self-defense is an analysis for you to decide were her beliefs reasonable, right? And that, I want to make sure I get that correct.
eight and nine of the jury instructions talks about that. And you're going to get a copy of these jury instructions. Is that legible? And here it's talking about it. <laughs> here it's talking about it in, the, in regards to second degree intentional. Apologize for chunking it up like this. But the jury instructions break it out into different parts. So that third part of self-defense is were her beliefs reasonable? And this is what you need to consider, all right? They need to, for second degree, consider whether or not she, that a reasonable person in those circumstances would not have believed she was preventing or terminating unlawful interference, or two, or three. But what I want to focus on is the last paragraph there. The reasonableness of her belief must be determined from the standpoint of Ezra at the time of her acts and not from the viewpoint of the jury now. The standard is what a person of ordinary intelligence and prudence would have believed in the position of Ezra McCandless under the circumstances existing at the time of the alleged offense. We started out with there's a fight in the back seat of the car. Those are the circumstances. That's the position of Ezra McCandless. We're going to talk about that more, but I wanted to frame that up for you because post-traumatic stress disorder is certainly something you need to consider. As well as what Dr. Hopper talked about regarding how the defense circuitry works and when there is an attack, how the amygdala overtakes your prefrontal cortex, your rational part of your brain. And then people begin to act. Ordinary and prudent people. All right? People of ordinary intelligence and prudence. When they're following their amygdala, they are relying upon habits and reflex. Habits and reflex. That's the circumstances under which you need to consider self-defense. So with that, let me just... Step back out of it now. Let's talk, go back to some of the facts that we talked about, right? I already talked to you about the facts establishing that there's a fight in the back seat of the car. Let's talk about the order of the events. Because the order of the events is very crucial here. The state says that there's a particular order that these things, that this alleged crime happened. I submit to you that the order of the event is what Ezra says happened, and it's supported by the evidence. I think some of these I may have talked about a little bit before, but I want to address them regarding the order of events. The back door is open, right? And no blood is on any of the door handles. To me, that leads us to believe that the door was open before the stabbing and the cutting. That eliminates the states that stood up here and said, he got stabbed, he ran away, he went to open up the car door, he opened the car door, he got into the car door, and she chased him, stabbed him in the back. I believe that's what he stood up and said here to you was their theory. The order of the events that there's no blood on that door handle. Because under their theory, he gets stabbed outside and he's bleeding all over. That's what explains all of the blood on the ground. Well, there'd certainly be blood on his hands. We saw all the pictures. His hands are covered in blood. And certainly if what their theory is, however odd or unlikely it is, under their theory, she'd have blood on her hands. That door was open. And that door was open because people were in the back seat of the car. And people were in the back seat of the car before any fight happened. That's the order of the events. Second point, there's no blood on the wallet, right? Picture of the front seat with the wallet. Put that back up. That's the front seat of the car. There's no blood on any of that, on the piece of paper, 
on the Visa card, on the wallet, on the dollar bill, on the $20 bill. There's no evidence whatsoever that there's any blood on any of those items, let alone on that front seat. So, what does that lead us to conclude? That wallet was taken out before any blood was shed. That wallet was taken out first, right? And what is the state's theory? And I think we agree. Where was the wallet? The wallet was in the center console. And where was the knife? The knife was in the center console. That was happened first, all right? That happened first. There's no blood on the center console opening it up, which means somebody was in that center console rummaging around prior to anything blood being shed. That's the order of events. No reason for Ezra to be rummaging around in her own center council, pulling out her own wallet. Under the state's theory, she had this knife and that was her plan all along. Why would she have been rummaging around through the center council to get it? It's the person who was just looking for stuff and came across it. That happened first. Three. Ezra sweater, right? That's Ezra's sweater. She was wearing that sweater. There's no evidence to the contrary. There's no evidence that she took it off. What we do know is it's got no blood on it. Zero. None. Nada. Zilch. No blood on that sweater. Why? Because Alex cut the sweater first. Under the state's theory, she cut it later, right? Under two ways. How would she be able to cut it? Scenario number one, she pulls her shirt out, or she pulls her shirt out, and she cuts it. Well, the knife would certainly be bloody. There's no knife, there's no blood on that. The hand marks from somebody with bloody hands would be all over that. There's no blood on that. Nobody with blood on their hands cut that sweater. That happened first. The state's theory strange as it is, and the first time we heard it is today, is that she took it off. She took it off at somehow after this stabbing, covered in blood, she takes it off, yet there's not any blood on that sweater. There's no blood on that sweater because Alex cuts it first. It makes no sense that Ezra would have cut it herself before any of this. Why would Alex be around if he sees somebody else cutting their sweater? Alex cut that sweater first. That's the order of the event. The blue button-up shirt, right? Now, you listen to Mr. DeFore's closing, but I heard him say, her blood's on that shirt. That's wrong. Flat out, completely, totally wrong. I'm misstates my closing argument. I never said what the one was on there. I said it was on the blue flannel shirt. Maybe I misheard. Fair enough. Interesting. But the bottom line is this. There's no evidence of blood on that shirt. There looks like there's reddish brown stains, right? But the state, who owns the crime lab, who has the crime lab, who sent all of this other evidence to the crime lab, didn't test that shirt. Didn't test it in any way. They didn't test that shirt. I believe the evidence was that there's reddish brown stains, and you may recall from your own observations of it, that there was a reddish brown stains up in this area, through this area, and on this little flap. Not to mention, on that flap, my tie is like this, and this is the shirt, right? And then it gets cut, and the flap falls down. There's blood on this side of that flap. Shirt's whole. There's blood on the outside of that. 
Shirt gets cut, falls down, there's blood here. How does that blood get there on the inside? It only gets there on the inside if it's cut first. The shirt is cut first, it's exposed, and then somebody bleeds on it. And a reasonable hypothesis, consistent with the evidence that they chose not to try to even attempt to disprove, is that blood is Alex's blood. All that blood is Alex's blood. It's just as reasonable. They say that he's bleeding all over the place. That's his blood on the inside of her shirt after it's been cut. That's the order of events. Sweater gets cut, blue shirt gets cut. That's how it happens. Um, now, how did it drip down on there, right? Depends, and we're going to go through Ezra's statements. But when they're face to face in that foot well, and she's fighting for her life, she wants to live and she's fighting for her life, and her shirt's up again, they're in its close proximity, she can get blood on her at that point, right? That's when the blood can get transferred onto that shirt from Alex. Order of the events, what else? Alex's DNA. It's on the knife handle. And if you recall, Kevin Scott came. He testified. I think there's three of his reports here, right? It was item O in the evidence. And he tested it for blood. And on the handle, there was two sources, Ezra's DNA and Alex's DNA. And what his testimony was is it was confirmatory for blood. But he can only confirm if it's one person's blood. So he could not rule out the possibility that it's Alex's touch DNA and it's Ezra's blood on that knife. They cannot rule that out. A reasonable hypothesis consistent with her innocence, he's holding the knife. And if he's holding the knife, it's because he's cutting her sweater, he's cutting her shirt. That happens First. <clears throat> the only reasonable hypothesis consistent with the evidence is that there's a fight in the back seat of the car. She struggled for her life, fought to survive, and when he, she finally, he stopped moving. He stopped strangling her. He stopped fighting with her. He stopped grabbing her. She stopped. He gets out of the car and he staggers around. And he staggers around so that there's blood. His blood on the ground. Right? And if you recall in the testing, right? His blood, his blood, cigarette, with his DNA, cigarette with his DNA, his blood, number 12 is his blood, right? A boot with his blood on the outside of it, a boot with his blood on the outside of it. Five is the footprint. This is all Alex's blood. Consistent with him being stabbed, getting out of the car, staggering, walking around. Every one of the medical experts, aside from Dr. Tillotson, I understand he's a medical expert, he didn't talk about the scene. Dr. Mills, Dr. Tovar, Dr. Thomas, all talked about somebody with the wounds that Alex Woodworth had would have still been able to walk, would have still been able to talk. And I believe the state essentially conceded in their argument just now, they just said, he ran, right? He ran. I don't know whether he ran or he walked, but we know medically possible for him to be walking around out there. That's the only reasonable hypothesis. Marker 15. Did you already give me that one? Here it is. This is marker 15. That's, at, that's the front tire, right? This here is the front tire. It's stuck in mud. Mud, that's the number 15. That's Alex's blood. That's well in front of the front door. The front door, you see here, right? 
That's marker 12. We can't even see 15 in the dark in this picture. 15 is in front of that. So he's up there walking around, he's here walking around, he's here walking around. There's something that happens. Inside, he gets up. It's a reasonable hypothesis consistent with her innocence. She's walking, he's walking around outside. So let me just briefly talk a little bit about Well, let me, uh, before I do that, I apologize. Alex's clothes. I believe we talked, we saw this, and I apologize. And just fair warning for everybody, I'm going to put up a picture of Alex. Those are his pants. He's standing up. Use your common sense. He's been stabbed. But that appears to me, I think using my common sense, that there's a person standing and blood is doing what blood does when they're in a standing position. Gravity has it run down their body. That means he's in a standing position after he got stabbed. State's theory is he stands... He gets stabbed, he runs into the car, then he falls down in the car, right? This happens really quickly. You saw his blood, his clothes were saturated in blood. Saturated in blood. Under the state's theory, he got stabbed and he's laying down in the car within seconds. Right? I mean, that's their theory. Is he got stabbed, he ran away, and he got into the car. That would take five seconds, ten seconds at the most. Probably not even that. That doesn't happen there. That's somebody who's standing. He got stabbed, and he's still standing. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later when I talk about the reasonable beliefs, because if he's still able to stand, he's still able to move. And remember, they're going to come back up here, I'm sure, and say, 16, 16, 16. They're going to say it over and over and over and over again. But we know this. He was still moving even then. He was still moving even then. So is it reasonable for a person to believe that even though they've used a certain amount of force and that person's up and they're moving, right? It didn't stop him. He's still up and moving. That's what his clothes show, right? That's the order of events. Again, we already talked about Alex's footprint not being disturbed. The blood evidence on the door frame, on the... Uh, Entrance to the door. So this is the. Uh, you'll see here's the car. Oops. So that's the picture of the car. I'm going to show you the next picture, which is going to be this area here, the back of the door frame, right? 16 and 17. This is the blood evidence. Somebody's, that's Alex's blood. Somebody's getting back into the car in that, and his blood's on that part of the car. There's a close-up of 16. Here's 11, which is the foot well in that same area. So as you come down on the car, this is where this is down by the feet. This is the footwell here. His blood, if you look at the pictures, his blood is around all of that entrance to the car. Somebody who's out of the car, bleeding, getting into the car after that. There's a, pictures of the top of the car. This is that same, that's the outside of that same car, right? It's hard to see on the, the permission to Hold in my hand, Judge, and show the jury. Here. So, in this area here, there's a blood smear. That's not some, that's not, that's Alex's blood. And that gets there, not from somebody who's running to retreat into a car, that gets there from somebody who's 
struggling and leans on the car in their own time to get into the car later, consistent with her testimony, consistent with her statements. That's the order of the events. We know it's medically possible. We know Ezra says he's outside the car when he leaves, right? Mr. DeFore got up here and said to you, she changes her story every time. She changes her story all the time. You confront her with evidence and she changes her story. You know what she did when she talked to the investigator, Proc? She said, he was outside when I left. And then she left. You know what she said on the stand? He was outside when I left. She wasn't there when he got back into the car. She's some big faker, some big set up the crime scene, some big person who's planned this whole thing out, right? She just missed that fact? Like when she's making up this story, she just forgot that according to Mr. DeForest, she left him in the car and tried to pull him out? And then when she sets up this big, big lie that she's going to say to the state because she's some big liar, she just forgets the fact of where his body is? <coughs> no. The gist of her story stays the same. It stays the same all the time. He was outside of the car. And then we know it's medically possible for him to get up. We know that. We know the evidence around the scene is he could have got up. He's standing. The footprint, he got into the car. He's the last person to leave a footprint in that area. That's from his shoes. I believe if we can even... Right, I've shown that before. We guess... That's the footprint, right? That's his shoe. That's his shoe. You'll recall probably her boot prints or her boots that were out there, right? Reason why bothers is that's his print. He's the last one there. We know this. There's no drag marks in the ground. There's no drag marks in the ground whatsoever. Nobody carried him into the car. She couldn't physically do that. You can argue about her weight, what her size is, but she's not carrying him into the car. Certainly not without getting blood all over every article of her clothing. And we know from his shoes, right, the back heel, you're dragging somebody into a car, you're probably going to drag them with your hands under the arms. The back or the bottoms of his shoes don't have mud piled up on the backs of the shoes or on the bottoms of the shoes in the heel area. Certainly not on any of them. Just a little bit of blood, a little bit of mud. Not on the tops. Not on the heels. He's not dragged into the car. He walks and gets into the car. That's what the evidence shows. And we already went through the blood evidence on the door frame, all right? So let's talk about this. Ezra's credibility, dare I say it. The state wants to attack it. The state wants to attack her. The state wants to say, don't believe it. Well, let's go through some things that I think we know. March 22nd. 410. 4.15, I apologize, all right? I got that wrong. 4.15 is the testimony. It was when the 911 call is, she's at Mr. Sipple's house. You heard the recording of her. You heard how she sounded. You've heard from medical professionals who basically, everybody agrees, she's not in the right state of mind there. Is their claim she's faking all that? Remember, their theory is her plan A is to do something and then she gets the car stuck. Plan A, I think their plan A, I think they said was she was going to not let the police, that's it. Plan A, they said, was she's going to kill him, not tell the police where it is so that she can go back there and clean up the scene, right? That's what they said their plan A was, right? But then they find the body, so then she has to come up with plan B. And plan B is, well, I was attacked, I was sexually assaulted, and all those things. But they're also standing up here and arguing plan C or D or E, I'm not sure, where they're saying she cleaned up the whole scene. 
right? They came up here and say, she cleaned up the whole scene, she set up the scene, she did all of those things. Well, if she set up the scene, then why is she later making these statements that you say she is because she has to go back to the scene to clean up the scene? Why even go to Don Sipple's house? I mean, there, it, it, I can't, you can go on and on and on about how much their theory makes absolutely no sense with the evidence, with common sense. First thing is, she's in a disassociative state. That's what the doctor said. That's what the medical records show, right? Dr. Benson got up here and testified, and I understand Mr. DeFore gets to make his arguments, but I submit to you, he's about as credible as a witness you'll ever see anywhere, anytime. And he diagnosed her with post-traumatic stress disorder with depersonalization and derealization, childhood onset, based upon the incidents that happened on March 22nd. Can't say what the incidents were, we get that. She's in this disassociative state. On the 22nd, when she arrives there, she doesn't know her name. She's some master planner that's trying to set this whole thing up. Why would you, I think I'm gonna to try to fake a mental condition? That makes absolutely no sense. And what we do know is when she got to the hospital, they put her in the hospital based upon her mental condition. So she just fooled all of these doctors, all of these other people, but the state knows better. People with not, with medical degrees know better. No, that's, they've done nothing to disprove that she was in that disassociative state. What else do we know? We heard from Dr. Hopper who talks about trauma and how trauma impacts the brain as far as memory goes, right? Yet the state wants to come up here and say, well, we get it, there's central details and peripheral details, and we agree with everything that Dr. Hopper says, but then when they say this would have been a central detail, they ignore what Dr. Hopper said. Because what Dr. Hopper said is, look, we don't get to decide what another person's central details are. We don't. I wouldn't know what any of your central details would be as I'm speaking right now, let alone if you were in, under a attack or had some traumatic event. And if you think about her statements, and I'm gonna go through it in detail, what the Dr. Hopper talked about was the gist of it. Remember, he had that slide. He said basically at the end, it's really just, you know, it's the gist of it, that's what we need to think about. And he talks about the tree and the trunk, and that's the main idea, and the details are the leaves. Well, what does she say right away to, to our farmer Sipple, right? She says, I was attacked. I wanted to get them off me. And I understand there was some confusion about pronouns because her and some of her friends at that time used pronouns that maybe aren't in the mainstream way of some other people using pronouns. But she was consistent. The gist of it was she was attacked. She needed to get somebody off of me. She spoke with Ember Shields. She spoke with Joe Wayne. She spoke with Corey Reeves. She spoke with the nurse, SANE nurse. She spoke with Kelly uh, Jennifer Morris. She spoke with the social worker, uh, Swartos. She talked about fear. She talked about being scared, right? That's the gist of it on the 22nd. She's in a disassociative state. She talks about fear. On the 23rd, when she meets with Mr. Proc, Detective Proc, she tells him she was scared. I understand. We're going to get back to the 23rd, right? She doesn't, she doesn't disclose everything. She doesn't share everything. But the gist of what she says, and when I asked uh, Detective Proc, he said, yeah, she said she was scared nine times. She used the word scared nine times. That's the gist of it. She said Alex was upset, I think, 11 times, maybe 12 times. You guys took notes. You can check that yourself. That's the gist of it. And then on the 24th, she says the same thing. Eventually, when, they, when she's in a position, place to share, she talks about being attacked 
in the back seat defending herself. That's the gist of what she says. We know about PTSD, right? And we know about that diagnosis that she got. And we heard from Dr. Benson that one of the conditions of that is somebody would not want to talk about that. And I think I forgot a point. just want to make sure that I get to it. Green notebook. What did Mr. Sipple say about this? I just want to go back, because you know what? We're talking about witnesses. Remember 90-year-old Farmer Sipple came in here and he talked to you guys. And what did he say? She was visibly shaking. She was really upset because what she went through. That's what he said. She was visibly upset because what she went through. <clears throat> Sounds like Don Sibyl believed her. PTSD. We move on. There's this avoidance, right? That's a symptom that we know it is. Somebody wouldn't want to talk about it. It's in the DSM-5, right? Exhibit 720B. First off, page 275, individual may experience disassociative states that last for a few seconds to several hours or even days during which components of the event are relived and the individual behaves as if the event were occurring at the moment. Some of that. The individual commonly makes deliberate efforts to avoid thoughts, memories, feelings, or talking about the traumatic event. I get it. They want to put everything in the scope of she didn't talk about it. That means she's deceptive. That means she's doing that deliberately to mislead them. Or a reasonable hypothesis consistent with her innocence is she was attacked. She fought for her life. She was in a disassociative state, she was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, and she was overwhelmed. A 20-year-old young lady, completely and totally overwhelmed. And she buried her head in the sand. I get that. She buried her head in the sand. And they want to say, because of that, you should convict her. Don't believe her because she acted like trauma victims act. She didn't want to talk about it. They want to talk about uh, the denial, this lying about memory. Again, I understand she didn't say that. What they don't have is her lying about the stabbing. They don't have that. She's not lying about the stabbing, right? They want to talk about lying about boy. And that is an odd fact in this case, right? I think we can all agree that is a completely and totally odd fact in the case. But that doesn't make her guilty of intentional homicide or reckless homicide. It doesn't mean she wasn't acting in self-defense. If anything, it's confirmation that she had trauma, right? And this is a response to trauma. Um, what else do we know? She never lies about the stabbing. The gist of the event is, is consistent. She's attacked, she's scared, he's upset, he keeps grabbing her, she wanted out and away. She doesn't lie about the how, the who, the when, or the why about March 22nd in the backseat of that car. We know about stress impairing retrieval, right? So even if the memory was there, depending upon how much stress she was under at different times, it's not organized in the way that a lot of other things of ours are organized. It's fragmentary, it's image images and it's not going to be in this time sequence all right and again i know i suspect it was difficult maybe it wasn't for detective proc when we went through the transcript of his interview right and maybe it feels to you as if we were attacking him that's not the point 
The point was, if they're going to judge Ms. McCandless on what she did or she did not say, you need to evaluate the way in which she was interviewed, which, and when she was interviewed, and how she was interviewed, and was she in a position at that time for somebody to get all of the information? Because I suspect the state wants all of that information. We wish we had all of that information. You wish we had all of that information. Because if that context and cues would have been there, she could have, she had them, right? But for whatever reason, on that day, for lots of reasons, her mental state, all right, the PTSD, uh, the stress impairing retrieval, perhaps her own denial or avoidance, right? And the lack of context or cues, she was not in a position to tell all of the information. But now they come to you later and say, well, she must be lying now because she's telling you different stuff. But what we heard from Dr. Hopper, remember my last questions to him, my last questions to him were about, we know that over time, recall can improve. Not memory, not the encoding, that's already done. Not the storage, that's already done. But the recall, the retrieval, the going and getting it out of our head and sharing it with somebody else. That can improve over time when the stress goes down. And so what's going to happen to basically anybody in a stressful situation when they're talking about things is they're going to, what we think of as, remember things later. They're going to be able to talk about things later that they couldn't talk about then. That's just the nature of trauma. And so for them to say, we agree with all of their research, he's fine, but then they come in here and they just don't on the other side, they attack her and they say, no, she adds stuff, she does this other stuff, therefore you can't believe her. That's contrary to the science. The science from the expert that they say knows it all, right? That's contrary to the science. Her having information later that's consistent with actually being a trauma victim. The inconsistencies that they do talk about, and I'm going to go through some of these, those are about peripheral details. And again, that's common for what uh, people in her position would do. Um, what she does tell, what she says, it's corroborated by the evidence. I've went through that. What she says is corroborated by the physical evidence. There's a fight in the backseat of that car. Her clothes were cut before that fight happened, all right? That's corroborated also by what she did earlier in the day. She, everything she says about that day is basically corroborated. She leaves out a non-event. She didn't tell the police about knocking on a door and nobody answering. Okay, I get it, she left that out, but I think we'd all agree, it's literally a non-event, right? She also didn't tell them when she stopped at a red light she didn't tell them other, other things that I imagine somebody would do in the morning. She didn't tell them those things. It just it was an unimportant, who cares detail, all right? She was openly with Max telling her she's going to go to Alex's. She's not trying to hide the fact that she went to Alex's. We have witnesses to her disassociation and stress, all right? How about her injuries? How about the mark to her neck, right? We've seen that picture. Permission to publish in person, Judge? You wait. You've seen this, right? Picture of the mark on her neck. The state didn't talk about that at all in their closing now. They didn't talk about it to begin with, right? So I suspect when they get back up here, because they get two shots at this, when they get back up here, they're going to talk about this. So I want to have a chance to know what they're going to say, because they've kind of sandbagged on that, not talked about it at all. But what we know from the evidence when people were up there testifying is the same nurse saw it, she documented it, she put it in her report. They're gonna say, well, nobody else saw it. Well, okay, but nobody else was doing an examination of her that the same nurse was doing. And what we know for sure is she was under constant supervision. Every witness that got up there, because they asked, did you see the mark on the neck? And they'd say, no, I didn't see the mark on the neck. And then I'd come back and say, but she was under supervision the entire time. Nobody saw her put this mark on her neck. Are they saying that she put this mark on her neck in the hospital? 
She was never alone in the hospital. She was with people all the time. You know why they would make such a ridiculous argument? Because they want this to go away. And they can't make this go away. This is real. She was strangled. And their only, only, only answer to it is, they just want to make it go away. Talk about denial. Talk about denial. This exists. It's in evidence. It happened. And it happened because what Ezra said happened is what happened. Let's think about it, really. What are the main challenges that they have to her credibility, right? They want to bring in, and I'm sure they're going to talk about it next. They want to talk all about this other man, John Hansen, all right? Tell me one piece of evidence that they brought to you other than this photo that they're going to show you, this photo of a young lady that took of herself and shared it with somebody, right? And they're trying to use her sex? They're trying to use that against a young lady? People say, no, I'm not trying to use that. Read the instructions, right? Read the instructions what the judge told you about what you can consider regarding this. But what she says about John Hansen, you saw the interview about that, right? They brought in nothing to, to, to say that that wasn't true. Where's John Hansen? Where's John Hansen? They didn't bring in John Hansen because he had nothing to add to their case. Because what Ezra said about John Hansen is what happened. She drank too much. She was vomiting. And she had a sexual encounter with somebody under that circumstance. She didn't call the police. She didn't call it all of these terms. Sounds like she regrets it. But that's what they want to bring in to attack her credibility, is her prior sexual behavior. In 2019, they want to shame a woman for having sex. They want to bring in Jason Mengel, former boyfriend. What does he say about her credibility? They didn't ask him about his opinion about her credibility, right? They brought in this Julia Post, middle school, high school friend. They didn't bring in Jason Mengel to say, she's got this reputation. It's all this background information about that. They want to bring in, right? The word boy, and her, that's what their main inconsistency is. She didn't talk about boy. How about this? Grabbing the knife. They talked about that a little bit. I want to go through that with you. It's on Exhibit 290. Because this is where they say it's an inconsistency. And the main part of it is on page 44. Page 44 of the transcript is where she talks about it. And if you recall, Mr. DeFore stands up here and says, she lied and changed her story about the knife after Dr. Tillotson testified in some other hearing, right? He got up here and looked at you and told you she said she grabbed the blade and pulled and got it away that way. That's what he said to try to convince you that she's a liar. What does she actually say? Right? He started to try to wrestle him and fight him off of me, kick and do whatever I could, but I got the knife and then I just started. How did you grab the knife? I grabbed it. I grabbed it from when I pulled. What did you grab? The blade? I grabbed the blade the one time, and that hurt a lot. Okay, so I tried grabbing the base of it. Okay, and then I just, I don't know. She doesn't say she pulls on the blade and pulls it from him. That's not what she says there. Absolutely that's not what she says there. And I believe at other parts of the transcript,
She talks about how she got the knife. Page 40. Which, remember, this is page 44, right? So just chronologically, before she gives this description, here's the description she gives at the bottom. And I cut my hand because I kept trying to grab it. And then, so... He kept grabbing me and stuff, and then I finally got free, and I finally got the knife away from them, and then he kept trying to grab me. That's what she says about how she got the knife. She doesn't say there that she pulls it away from him. She doesn't say that. And I believe in another even spot. Top of page 44. That's where he says it, just before the other quote that I had. And then, so we have the first one I did 40 in the middle. I didn't do it in chronological order, I apologize. I started to try to wrestle him and fight him off of me, kick and do whatever I could, but I got the knife and I just started. She said in her testimony, she kicked him, she kneed him, she got the knife. She says to Proc, I tried to wrestle him, fight him off, kick and do whatever I could, and I got the knife. And the state stands here and asks you to convict a young woman who's in a fight in the backseat of her car, struggling to survive. And they say, no, she said she pulled the knife from him. No, she didn't. She didn't say that. She never said that. She said she kicked him, she fought him, she got the knife. As, uh, Ezra's testimony about Alex. They say, well, she's never said anything about Alex before. If you remember from the testimony, she interviewed with Investigator Proc on March 1st. And on March 1st, she talked about Alex. They were saying, what happened with John? And then she said, after I saw John, I went and saw this other friend, Alex, and something happened, and it hurt. It's unclear what she said by hurt, but she said it hurt. She says that on March 1st. On March 23rd, when she speaks with Investigator Brock, on page 14, she talks about it where she's talking about Alex. And she says, line 609, or what, let's go through it. What were you scared of on line 599? Being hurt. By who? Alex. By him doing what? Him harming me, making me want to do something he wanted. He was upset. All right? And then as she says at the end, on line 616, I was, uh, he would kind of get upset when I was too sensitive or in pain and stuff during those interactions, during sex. She told him, Proc, on the 1st that sometimes this happened. She tells Proc on the 23rd that sometimes this happened. She tells Proc on the 24th that sometimes this happened. She tells you in her testimony sometimes it happened. And they get up here and say, she's never said this before. She didn't say it all before. She does say it. She says it there. She talks about his journals as well. So let me just we went through the gist, right? Let's talk about the state's theory just a little bit. Because one of the first things that the state talked about in their closing was just make sure we get the law right. The, main, the first charge the state stood up and argued for, they're saying she had the intent to kill. Right? Bottom of the instruction. Intent to kill that she had the mental purpose to take the life of another human being or was aware. Those are two ways that they can prove intent. She's never said she had the mental purpose whatsoever. She said all along, I wanted to get him off. I wanted to get him away. I didn't even want this to happen. I didn't want any of it to happen. That wasn't her mental purpose. 
And then they have to say that she was aware. Not that she should have been aware. Not that any, anybody else might have been aware. Not that a reasonable person could have been aware. They have to prove actual awareness of this young lady in that moment at that time in order to prove intent. And I submit to you that they can't. And that's why they made the argument that they did. Because if you read the law, she had no intent to kill. She w didn't have it. She wasn't aware of it. On the next page, on page five, when it talks about deciding about intent, right? Intent to kill must be found, if found at all, from her acts, words, and statements. Certainly not from her words. It's certainly not from her statements. And it's certainly not from her acts. Her acts are, she stabbed him until he stopped. Once he stopped, she stopped. When she left, he was still alive. We know that. Because when she left, he was on the ground, and he got up and he moved. She didn't have the intent to kill him. Talked about some of this. Um, they talk about their, uh, her evolving story, and I just I need to go through this, I know. But what are there, again, we talked about the different plans that she said that they had. She went to Sipples, fakes this disassociative episode, pretends to lie about this all because she doesn't want anybody to see the scene, right? She wants, and then she lies about Owen Park. Read the transcripts. She doesn't say she was at Owen Park. She says, maybe I was. She talks to Reeves and the people at the hospital about a park. She doesn't say she was there. There's some confusion, no doubt. But this theory that she's trying to keep them away from the, the scene, all right, is contrary to their own theory where they say she staged an event so she could set up self-defense. If she staged the event to set up self-defense, why wouldn't she just go and tell Farmer Sipple, I was attacked, he's over there, he tried to rape me, he tried to do this. That's, uh, their, their theory makes no sense. It undercuts their own theory. They talk about her purpose is going there to confront him, to get him to change his mind. Again, use your common sense. If I want to have a relationship with a person like Jason Mangle, why would I need to worry about somebody that's over there? That, I'm not, they're not in the way. She saw Jason Mangle that day. She wanted to be with Jason Mangle. She could have been with Jason Mangle. Alex wasn't in the way. She didn't have to confront Alex to get him out of the way. Her and, her and Jason were fine. They'd been talking back and forth. They were fine. They had like 637 texts the day before, Instagrams the day before, that I'm sure they're going to get up here and talk to you about, right? But then why would she be worried about somebody that's off, off over there? She didn't do that to confront him. She's there for 45 minutes beforehand, and everything's fine. Their whole plan about she goes there with the knife in order to do something, a house full of guns, and five foot two inch... 120, 130 pound woman says, I think I'm going to go kill somebody and I'll get in a hand to hand comment in the back seat of a car out in a rural secluded area. That's their theory? That's what they say happened? Does that ring true in any way, shape, or form? Is there any evidence to even support that? Frankly, it's ridiculous. Um, the, they try to impeach her with the carb getting stuck. Right? Well, why didn't she just back up? If you recall pictures from the scene, all right, as you see, she's driving up, somebody's driving up, Alex's driving up, her's driving up, and we'll talk about that later. These are glared, so. There's no vehicle that gets stuck on the way up on the top of that hill, right? The car gets up over the hill, and then as you heard the witnesses say, then there's southern exposure, and things are softer and warmer, and then the car gets stuck. And once the car gets stuck, a car gets stuck. He's like, well, you, you should have turned around before you got stuck, but they didn't know they were going to get stuck until you're stuck, right? And so the car gets stuck. I, I don't even, it doesn't even make sense. Um, and then he says, well, they should have 
She should have done something. She should have asked for help. She doesn't have a phone, if you recall. I doubt there's wireless out there, right? She doesn't have a phone. Um, they try to uh, say that she must have had some guilty intent because she didn't do what her dad said. She didn't do what Jason Mengel said. She drove into Eau Claire. 20-year-old woman with her own car, driver's license, decides to go to Eau Claire. Her dad didn't want her to. Fine, fair enough. That doesn't mean because a 20-year-old doesn't do what their dad says that they're some evil intent. She's never said anything about, they talked in here about scratching boy into her arm on the road. That's not what she said. She's never said that to anybody. She didn't say that to you. Um, they talk about Joe Carlin and the, the knife. She's got three knives in the car. There's just knives in the car. She's trying to set up some attack. Why would she have some of the other knives? Why would there be knives in the trunk? If they have some evil intent that she says that they have, why would she have just left some of the weapons there? doesn't make any sense. She doesn't ditch the knife or the phone, right? If she has some evil intent and she wants to throw them away, she'll throw them away. They're right along the side of the road. Speaking of which, I think I forgot to mention before when we were talking about the clothes and the knife and everything like that, their theory is, oh, because the knife doesn't have her blood on it, that somehow she wiped the blood off? Is that what they're going to say? Right? Alex's blood was on the blade, right? I believe the officer, or the, the Kevin Scott said he took a Q-tip along the entire blade from the tip all the way to the bottom, from the tip all the way down. And he found Alex's blood on there. All right? But what's the state's theory? The state's theory is she cut him and then cut herself. So if that's the state's theory that she cut him and then cut herself, why wouldn't her blood be on that blade? That doesn't make, that doesn't support, so I don't even know what their argument was, to be honest, because it doesn't make any sense. But what we do know is if he cut her first and then she got uh, cut, defended herself, his blood would be there. And then she does what she does with boy. Let's talk about that for a second, because the, the evidence of her shirts, I think we've already got it up here, they claim it had to be when she took it off. This is the first shirt she's wearing, right? That's the flannel. There's a cut on the sleeve. Just watch. I got sleeves on my shirt, right? When I go like this, you know what happens? The sleeve comes up. So they're trying to say, like, she took off all of her clothes and then tried to cut through. No, there's a cut there. It just, it just got pulled up. Um, what's her next article of clothing then? Is the sweater, if you recall. And the sweater's got holes in it as well. And we were talking about the sweater with Kevin Scott. Remember the size of that hole with Rich Day? And then I talked about this sweater and the size of that hole. How that was just a little bit smaller, but it was in the same spot. And then we have the blue button up, which has a hole here, right? That's consistent with somebody starting in the outside layer, making a hole, making another hole, making a third hole. And then that's her, all right? Um, that's never tested. That's in evidence, right? So we don't know whose blood is on any of that. But it could have been his blood got transferred onto that sleeve right there. It's him. Their, their arguments don't make any sense with the evidence. They talk about her wanting to lie so that she can buy time to clean up, right? What evidence is there that she couldn't have walked out of the hospital at any time that she wanted? There's no evidence that she couldn't have done that. She was in a hospital. If she needed to get out of the hospital, she goes out, gets out of the hospital to go clean up the scene. It's ridiculous theory. Totally ridiculous. 
that she's trying to avoid to try to buy time for it. Um, the phone fell apart. Again, she said she was running, phone fell down. Alex's injury to his head. You heard from Dr. Tovar, right? And just makes common sense about a dynamic, a fight. If you're in a knife fight, it's dynamic. People are gonna be moving around. The fact that he got stabbed on the right side of his head, they say makes her guilty of stabbing him from behind. But he's also stabbed on the right side of his neck. Like, people move their heads all around at all kinds of different times. We, she doesn't know when and how it happened. That's not evidence that she did it from behind in any way. I'm looking at you. Now my right side of my head is exposed. I mean, it just that's what happens. And people are moving around in that situation. <clears throat> their theory that that's what they're going to hang their hat on, that's what the hook that they're going to say, she must be lying because she couldn't have stabbed him in the right side of her head. That's not, that doesn't ring true. That's not, con that doesn't make any sense. The center console with, Mr. with Officer O'Neill, they try to tell you that she doesn't open the center console. There's no evidence of that. Officer O'Neill never got up here and asked, told you that she did not open the center console. That's not what he said. He never said that. Check your notes. Check your memory. He didn't say that. That's what their theory was, is she wasn't willing to open up the center console because she didn't want to expose this knife that was in the center console. She said in the tape, as you heard, I'm looking for it, right? You heard that in the tape. And she produced something. We don't know eventually, even in that picture that I showed you of the wallet in the front seat on the, on the ground, nobody's testified. Oh, I, I, I take that back. Ms. McCandless testified that her license was in her wallet. Uh, Dr. Tillotson, I understand again uh, about his testimony. Remember, he saw her for 20 minutes. 20 minutes. And his testimony was about, well, you'd have this type of injury. And their whole thing, you'd have this type of injury <laughs> if you grabbed the knife and pulled it away. That's their whole theory was based upon that. If you grab the knife and pull it away, you're going to get cut like this. Well, we just went through what she said about the knife, right? She never said she grabbed the knife away from the blade. This is a whole, they're trying to misdirect you. They're not going on the facts. They're just, they're making stuff up. They're just making stuff up. Dr. Tillotson saw her for 20 minutes. He never came back, consulted any other evidence. He didn't say anything else. What she says, what the other doctors talked about, Dr. Tovar, Dr. Uh, Thomas, of somebody, you can, it's dynamic, right? If your hand hurts, you gotta push, pull it back. It could get superficial, it could be a defensive wound. Uh, again, I put in here Tillotson, grabbing of the blade, look at that. They talked about, uh, I believe the state put up one of those pictures and said that her blood was on the clothes, right? I believe the only shirt that had her blood on it was the blue flannel on the outside. And as you can see here, her blood, I believe, was tested on the sleeve, right? So where she cut herself, her own blood was there. And then her blood is on this L1 stain that you can see in the other spot. Which again, if her left hand is cut and she goes like that once, that's going to be her blood there. There's no other blood that they've tested on there because she's wearing that like a jacket and it's open. And this fight that happens in the backseat of the car happens quickly, quickly, quickly. And it's done. It's over. They're upright against each other. He gets out and then it's over. Right? He's not dripping, he's not bleeding in that situation. He walks away. It's not going to get blood all over her if she's trying to set up the scene. That's when it's going to get blood all over her. That doesn't happen. Speaking of which, the, his clothes. They want to talk to you about, well, his clothes, if you looked at the evidence, his coat had his blood on it. They stood up here and told you, no, it didn't. I submit to you that, yes, it did. The testimony that you heard from Scott 
And I believe that's on um, Kevin Scott. Exhibit 339, item B4 is the coat recovered from the rear of the driver's side. All right, on report 9, page 3, DOJ 806 of exhibit 339, Alex, Blood, Alex Woodworth is the source of this DNA. So again, he got up here and said, Alex's blood isn't on the coat. Yeah, it is. Their own crime lab said it is. And their own crime lab came here and told you that it is. It had two marks in the back, but they're right. It didn't have marks here. It didn't have marks on the side. And you know, what we know is Alex had been stabbed on that side. Yes. I submit to you, this is his sweater, right? That's the back of his sweater. His clothes are moving all over the place. He's got a coat on. His coat is open. He's stabbed in this area. It could very well have happened with his coat open, not through the coat, right? But we know he's stabbed here. If you look at the photos when we do that, and I don't want to pull them up there again, but if you recall, it's on his side. That, look it up on the top there. You have the pointer. Thank you, Anna. <coughs> This is the back of the sweater, right? That's the upper right shoulder where they say he got stabbed in the back. This is the back of the sweater. There's the other stab mark in the back. These three punctures are in the back of the sweater. But he didn't get stabbed in the back on that side. He got stabbed on the side. Because when you're in a fight, when it's a dynamic process like that, your clothes are moving all over the place. And so for them to say she must have stabbed him when he didn't have his coat on makes no sense with the sweater evidence either. Because according to them, he'd have three puncture marks in his back. But he doesn't. That's on the side. Because you know what? Clothes move when you move. They, especially if you're moving quickly and a lot. The clothes are going to be moving all over the place. Some of this I've covered already. Those are moving. <laughs> I don't want to belabor the point. Just So lastly, let me talk a little bit about the scene, because they might come up here and talk about the scene. So if this is the car, right? I'm going to just put up the picture of the back seat of the car. If I can find it again. This is the picture I want. This is a big blood stain, right? That's the big blood stain. Alex gets out of the car, he walks around, he tries to keep, he lays down as Ezra said. He's got his coat off at this point. That's how the coat gets off. He doesn't take his coat off in the car. He gets back into the car and then he sits down on the edge of that seat. Sits down right like that. That seat is that seat. That's what this is, right? And then at that point, he's moving around in the back seat. I submit to you that, where's the front seat with the marker 33? That's the, that's the driver's seat, right? So if this is the back seat, this is the front seat, that is right here behind me, right? So if you're sitting back here, you need help. Alex was up. He got into the car. He needs help. He puts his hand on the driver's seat, and he pulls himself forward, and he tries to honk the horn. Right? Because we know his blood is there on 33. We know his blood is there on 31, right there. 
and it's not anywhere else on the seat. How does his blood get there? Because from the back seat, he reaches forward, tries to honk the horn. That's what explains that. And then on the other side, we have the painting. Right? And his blood is on the painting here. His blood is on the painting in this situation. Well, if that painting was sitting up in the seat, this is the front seat, and that's the painting. He puts his hand here, he reaches over, knocks that down, goes to do that. That explains the blood there. He's not in the front seat with the blood. He's not moving around after that. This Dates theory makes no sense. That makes sense. That's how we explain that evidence, right? So I'm probably overstating my welcome, and I need to move on to talk to you about what I think are probably the two most important things. So, Judge, I probably have about a half hour left. I know I've been talking for a while. Happy to go on. I we need a break. I don't need a break. I'm asking if anybody else. All right, anybody in the jury need a break? Yes. Here, yes. Okay. I think we'll take a 10 minute recess. Um, that, you think that's sufficient, uh, Ms. Jones? Yes. Okay. Hi. All right. Um, all rise. Appreciate your patience. I understand this is long. I only get one chance. I only get one chance to stand up here and talk to you about the last 15 days. I get one chance to make this last. Argument. It's less fight for her life. So I appreciate that it's long, and I'm sorry that I might stay up here too, but I don't want to sit down. She's innocent. So if you'll indulge me, I want to talk about two more categories that I think are crucial to your doing your duty and coming back with the not guilty verdict. Because you've been here for three weeks, right? Three weeks. And every day when we finish, the judge says, you can't talk to anybody about it. Don't talk to anybody about it. Don't talk to anybody about it. We're all talking to everybody about it. We're talking amongst ourselves about it every day. I imagine that they're talking about it amongst themselves every day. I imagine everybody out there is talking about it every day. And you haven't had that chance yet, right? But you're going to. You're going to go and deliberate. And if you do your duty, you'll find that she was acting in self-defense. And then on Monday or Tuesday or whatever day that is that you go back and you enter into the world or Saturday or Sunday, you're going to see your friends. You're going to see your loved ones. You're going to see your work colleagues, everybody else. And they're going to say, where have you been? What you been doing? And you can get to tell them. Well, I was on this jury, right? I, I was on a jury, on a homicide case, on an important case. And I'm sure they're going to ask you, what did you do? And why did you do it? And when you tell them, it's my duty <coughs> to follow the law. And I took that serious. <coughs> I took that serious when the judge says you have a duty to follow the law. And we looked at all the evidence, and when I did that at the end, I had to conclude she's not guilty. And I'll say, but how? How? How can you do that? She, she stabs somebody. And you'll be able to say, you know what? She was acting in self-defense. And my hope is that I can tell you now so that you can explain it to your loved ones, your colleagues, everyone else out there. And you can be proud of how you did your duty and you followed the law. 
and supported the woman in a back seat fighting for her life, acting in self defense. Your Honor, asking them to support someone is an inappropriate argument. Don't believe it is, but I'll move on, Judge. All right, thank you. Um, to consider Ezra's beliefs, right? We talked about before there's three things. First two are, does she have an actual belief? And before I get into it, I just want to talk a little bit about the instructions, right? Because there's four different counts that she's charged with, right? And so I think of them as the, the first one is first degree intentional homicide. We talked about that already. They have to prove that it's intentional and she didn't have these beliefs. If you vote, if you find, nope, she had these beliefs, then you move on to the next charge, which is called a lesser charge of second degree intentional. And again, you'd need to consider whether it was intentional, which I submit to you, there's no evidence that it was intentional. Their theory of motive is, is frankly bizarre. It's not supported by any evidence, certainly not evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. We talked about intent and her lack of awareness of that. At second degree, you need to consider whether it's intentional, as well as self-defense. If you find it's either not, if you find it's not intentional, you can then go and consider a different crime, which is first degree reckless. And there's definitions of recklessness, and you also have to consider whether there's utter disregard for life. You might say, look, there's no utter disregard for life, and the judge defines it and how you can consider that, and then you'd have to consider the th last choice, second degree reckless, which would consider, again, cause of death, recklessness, and self-defense. But what I'll submit to you now, and which I want to talk to you about, is self-defense, and the way that I'm going to talk to you about it right now, washes all of those away. Right? So when you go back there and you deliberate, if you conclude she was acting in self-defense, you don't have to analyze intent, you don't have to analyze recklessness, you don't have to analyze all those other things. Self-defense, she's not guilty. So let me talk to you about self-defense, right? We said it was this belief. So what's the evidence that she had a belief? It's her actual belief, her subjective belief, her personal belief. Not whether she should have had it, not any of that, but those first things are, did she believe that? Well, we know this, right? So it's a state's burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Meaning if you pause, remember a reasonable doubt is a doubt that would cause a person of ordinary prudence and intelligence to pause or hesitate when called upon to act in the most important affairs of life. It doesn't say stop. It doesn't say turn around. It says it to pause or a hesitation. So that's reasonable doubt, right? It's the state's burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt she did not actually believe, one, there was an unlawful interference, and two, she needed to stab him to get him off and get away. Or, I think as the law said, it calls it, right, that she believed the amount of force she used or threatened to use was necessary to prevent or terminate the interference. So what's the evidence that she believed it? What's the evidence? The evidence is, at Farmer Sipple's house, she told Farmer Sipple, I was attacked. She said, I had to get them off me. That's her first words when she's in this disassociative state, hyperventilating, hysterical, crying, uncontrollably sobbing, we heard from witnesses. You heard it yourself. In that state, she still says, she was attacked. She had to get them off of me. That's her belief. At Farmer Sipple's house, what's her appearance like? Second thing to consider, right? We have her words, and the state says, but those are just her words. Those are just her words. Don't believe her words. Well, fine, let's look at her appearance, right? Everybody says, she looks like my words. She's a wreck, a total and complete wreck. Again, she's crying, she's sobbing, right? She sounds hysterical. She looked hysterical from all the witnesses. This isn't just her words. This is her appearance. This is her demeanor. This is all of it. 
all of it. She was scared. That's her actual belief. Dr. Benson's diagnosis, right? He says it's consistent with, or it's because of trauma, right? Now, we don't know what trauma, sure, fair enough. We don't know what trauma is. But it's certainly consistent with her having that belief. His diagnosis is consistent with that. At the hospital, same thing. Her appearance, her behavior, her statements, talk about her belief she was scared, she was attacked. On March 23rd, her statements to Proc that we talked about already, she says nine different times, and we've gone through that, how she was scared. On the, on the March 24th, she talks about how she has these intrusive memories, right? She was, and I think it's on page 55, I'll just read it to you. Line 2499. Because it was just so scary and I can't get it out of my head. She can't get it out of her head because it scared her to death. She's never fought like that before. That's what she told Brock. Listen to the recording. She says that on the recording. I don't think this is where I, you have to listen to the recording. All right? She says it was because she was scared. Intrusive memories consistent with her having this fear from the trauma. Again, also on the 24th, she consistently says, she tells him about the attack. She says how she was scared. It starts on page, you may want to review the records when you go back there. You may not. That's going to be up to you. Maybe you won't need them. get-go, I believe it's on, well, I'm going to use my version because it's easier to mark it up. Line 1790, oh, starts on page 40 at the top, right? 39, line 1775, what, actually even before that, line 1754, what do you remember? This is where it starts. Her first word, and she starts to disclose it. I remember being really scared and in a lot of pain. She then goes on, what happened to Alex? She says, I got him off me. Line 1781, it's just really painful. It's not clear there whether she's talking about the pain of talking about it or the pain of what happened. She says, it's just really painful. And then they ask, basically, what happened? She says, he grabbed me, he grabbed me again, he put me in the back of the car, he seemed really upset, and he kept, he kept grabbing me, and I didn't know what to do. He started cutting my pants. 1808, he started cutting my pants. I didn't know what to do and it was really scary. And then he started cutting my shirt off me and I didn't know what to do. And I had, and I went to go make him stop because he had this arm. And then she goes on and she talks about how she was grabbed and she was afraid. She was afraid and she was grabbed and she was attacked. And they're gonna attack her again. But the gist of it is, and these are her central details, the gist of it is she had that belief. She believed something was happening, and she believed she needed to do that. That's what she believes. That's what she says on those dates. We already went through, are her beliefs supported by the evidence? The evidence is, I submit to you, there's a fight in the backseat of the car. That's consistent with her having this belief, right? She had those actual beliefs. Now, um, Dr. Harper, Hopper also testified about what happens to the brain under attack, right? The defense circuitry and how the amygdala takes over and it's the reflexes and habit, but that's because of the stressor. 
That's the stressor that happens. She had that fear. She had that belief. That's consistent with the evidence. Alex's journals. There's an instruction on how to use Alex's journals. Let me just say this. This case is about Ezra McCandless's state of mind. I understand that it also involves a young man by the name of Alex Woodworth who lost his life. This is a homicide. It doesn't get more serious than that. And it's tragic. And as Ezra said in her statements, she didn't want it to happen. And there's a death of a young man. And his parents, his family, they've been here a whole week, three weeks. And I just want to acknowledge I'm up here speaking of their son, right? And I don't mean it in that way. I'm sure it feels that way. But we need to talk about some of this stuff to try to figure out what was Ezra McCandless thinking. But I, I want you to follow that instruction. This is not meant to disparage or label Alex Woodworth as a particular character or person, right? I know from the evidence what Ezra McCandless has said he said. We know what he wrote. We know what she says happened in the backseat of the car. I want to talk to you about that. But I just wanted to acknowledge we get it. And I think I'll move on. But his journals, right? She had a belief. And her belief in some way was based upon his journals. And you know what you'll recall from what the judge says the instruction is, a belief may be reasonable even though mistaken. Right? A belief may be reasonable even though mistaken. You have heard absolutely no evidence whatsoever that Ezra McCandless is a philosophy major that she has a degree in philosophy or a master's in philosophy or that she's an expert in philosophy or Kierkegaard or Derrida or Caputo or anyone else for that matter. And we could go on and on down the list of philosophers. We don't have the evidence about that, right? We know what he wrote. And I'll tell you this, it's confusing Right? I don't know that anybody necessarily understands it. But the point is this. This supports that she would have that belief. Might have been wrong. I'm not here to say that our interpretation or the state's interpretation is right. I think to some degree that's beside the point. The point is there's some stuff in here that I think needs to be interpreted. And it's some scary stuff. It's not your everyday writing. I think we all agree with that. It's not typical. It's not usual. I imagine that none of you have ever read or had friends read to you their journals about cannibalism. Right? But in the end, he writes about this. Metaphorically, <laughs> literally, he writes about some stuff in here that might cause a 19, 20-year-old woman, she was 19 when she met him, 20 years old at that time, to start thinking at some point, and not initially, right? We understand she went to his house, she wasn't afraid of him on the 22nd. She got in the car, she wasn't afraid of him. She wasn't afraid of him until the knife came out and the words attached to the knife she started to hear. And that's when this stuff starts flooding into her mind, as it would, I imagine, anyone. So let's just talk some about, a little bit about this, because the state talks about the journal from December 20th, desire and will, and how this is, uh, this is the true meaning of his journal, is this one entry on December 20th. Might be. And that, that uh, portion of it from DOJ 2531 
reads, love and do as you desire transforms into infinite obligation. It says, if you actually love, you'll give and give no matter what your love asks for, that is your desire. Is he talking about himself or is he talking about Ezra? Is he talking about himself or is he talking about Ezra? If you actually love, you'll give and give no matter what you love, ask for. That is your desire. Because you'll remember, they, she testified and talked about how he would test her, push her to be vulnerable. Close your eyes. Be blindfolded. No safe words. You need to basically fully, completely, and totally commit to this. And for reasons that are perhaps unique to Ezra, perhaps they're not unique to Ezra, she maybe didn't always want to be completely and utterly fully vulnerable, right? So this meaning, this interpretation, it may be that Alex is looking to give, but it may be that he's talking about what he expects from somebody else. If you love me, you need to give me all of this. You need to give me, you need to give me, you need to give me. Because we know what he writes in other places. On 25, 11. There is love, so do as you will. Don't worry about self-control. Be excessive. If you want to, that is. There's nothing you ought to. Anything goes. He also writes that. He writes, do as you will so long as you love, which gives far less freedom, as one cannot do anything when one loves, and love can cause quite limiting obligations. Later on, on February 3rd, he starts talking, I love you all, each and every author, reader, writer, you. Know that whatever becomes of me, for this unconclusive postscript is my suicide note. It will only be found post-mortem. Always prefer life and never stop affirming survival. I love you and am smiling at you from wherever I am. That was from authors and others from February 3rd, 2018, DOJ 2566. I'm smiling at you from wherever I am. That's what he writes in February. Previous to that in January, in giving space on DOJ 2546, Say that I come to absolutely know you, but you do not know me. In this, I gain complete power over you, and you will lack the ability to resist me. This is the case, even if absolutely knowing was reciprocal. Later, or previous to that, on November 24th, when probably writing about Ezra, uh, on DOJ 2501, he writes, I am not even sure that I do love you, yet I feel that I can do what I want which is, I suppose, a sort of indication that love is occurring. These are the things that he wrote that she had read or had heard from him. So when she says she had certain beliefs, that he said these things to her as well, this corroborates that. They're like, well, how else would anybody know what he said to you? Well, that's fine. But he wrote it. He wrote it. If he wrote it, it doesn't, it's a reasonable hypothesis, consistent with the evidence, that he said it. And that he said it to her, if he's writing about her. Uh, I, I, guess I just want to point out that there is some type of pink note on the front of what counsel keeps showing to the jury, which is clearly not evidence. Okay. And Very good. Note is removed. So to then say she didn't have this belief, her belief is supported by the collateral information. She says she believed this because there's a journal out there that says it, right? And again, she may not have believed it before, but when there's a fight in the back seat of the car and the person that's got the knife is saying things to you and it's consistent with what they've written before and it's consistent with what they've told you before, that supports the fact that she actually had that belief. Their theory is she's just making that all up. And of course, the belief makes sense if there's a fight in the back seat, right? And we've went through already, 
established. There was a fight in the back seat. There's a fight in the back seat. The reasonable hypothesis is a person in a fight in that back seat would have those two beliefs. The one leads to the other. Her beliefs, and this is where we get to it uh, before, is the gist of it, right? Her testimony, her statements, or as the statements say, her story, right? In some pejorative sense, like, all of a sudden that's a bad word. She's not making anything up. The gist of what she says is consistent throughout. She was attacked. She was scared. She believed she had to fight for her life. She had those beliefs. You find that the state can't disprove that. If the state has not convinced you beyond a reasonable doubt that she had those two beliefs, and you have to find her not guilty of first degree intentional. You have to. You're required. Then the last bit is this. Her beliefs were reasonable. Right? And we talked about that before. So I want to find the part to put up on, the, on there the standard for you to consider when considering whether her beliefs were reasonable before I go through this. So, were her beliefs... Well, let me say this too before I move on to that. Because one of the things the state's going to say is, you know what? She's a faker. They've said that already, right? Don't believe her because of her demeanor when she gets up on that stand. That's what they said, right? They say, put a camera in this young lady's face, put her on trial for 15 days, judge everything that she does at any moment, any time, because if she does something, we're going to point it out to you. If she cries, she's trying too hard to cry. If she doesn't cry, she's cold-blooded. If she has this emotion, she's guilty. If she has the opposite emotion, she's guilty. If she has the middle emotion, she's guilty. She couldn't do anything, no matter what she does. No matter what she does. They say, that's proof of this. <coughs> Yet we know from the experts, we know from the experts, response to trauma is unique to every individual, right? Who amongst us could say how a person would respond in that life-threatening situation? Who amongst us could say how a person would, could, should respond when they're on trial for their life at 20 years old, with cameras all over the place, a professional, experienced lawyer cross-examining her about any little thing that she's ever said or done or picture shown anywhere or man she's ever flirted with or t had sex with. And then they have the audacity to get up here and tell you, judge her based upon her demeanor, judge her based upon her emotion. That's fine. The cameras do that all the time. Whatever. Let them do that. That's not you. That's not how we do business. That's not in a court of law. You should consider all of those things under jury instruction 300 to determine her credibility. But remember, she was 20 years old. She's fighting for her life. She's got one year of college and she's up on that stand. And no matter what she said or did, her demeanor was going to be criticized by the prosecution team, the team of professionals who would get together every night to try to figure out how they could show she's this faker. But they haven't done that. Is this uh... tell you what the, the evidence is regarding her, the reasonableness of her beliefs, right? Because it's, again, 
under the circumstances at that time, and it's reasonable even if mistaken. So those are the two lines that you need to, to look for, and I can find it right there. Here we go. Belief may be reasonable even though mistaken. The reasonableness of Ezra's beliefs must be determined from the standpoint of her at the time of her acts and not from the jury viewpoint of the jury now. The standard is what Oops. A person of ordinary intelligence and prudence would have believed in the position of Ezra McCandless at the time of the alleged offense. That's the standard, right? So let's look at it. Under these circumstances at that time, what's the place? Back seat of a car stuck out in the middle of nowhere with a man with no phone alone. That's the circumstances. Back seat of the car, stuck out in the middle of nowhere, right? What else should you consider, right? Alex's words. What did Alex say? She got up here, she told you. He said, I deserve you. Believe, and I, I want to make sure that I... I deserve you one last time. That's what she testified to. Those were his words. And you might say, oh, oh, well, I mean, there's the issue. Did he say that? And we talked about that. Read his journals. What was his statements that he's made in the past? Is that a, what I would consider, I think you should think, is that a credible threat? Your Honor, I'm going to object to Counsel is arguing that they should use the journals as propensity evidence, which is improper. Sustained. But, I didn't mean to imply that if I did, I apologize. We've talked about the journals. The journals support her belief is what I'm trying to articulate, right? The journals support her belief that it's reasonable, meaning she's read his journals. She has this opinion. Might be wrong, might be right, but it's reasonable from her standpoint to say this is a credible threat. This is a person who's wrote these things and said these things to me, and now he's in the car, in the back seat, with a knife, and he's making statements. That's a credible threat. Um, and they're, as I said, they're credible because of what she's read and because of what he's said. And now, and now he has a knife. And we went through the whole issue about who has the knife, all right? Who had it first? And I'm not going to go over that again. But I think the evidence supports he had the knife. He cut her clothes. We went through all of that. That makes her beliefs reasonable. He's cutting her clothes. He's cutting her. He's cutting her. The state says, don't believe any of it, right? got that injury to her leg. Right. That's consistent with him cutting her, him stabbing her. We know that from Dr. Tovar. We know that from Dr. Thomas. Dr. Tillotson, granted, he gave his opinion after 20 minutes. And if you recall, what he said right away at that time was, it's all about boy, 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 boy. Here's this woman who comes into his office and he says he wants to care for her to get her the help that she needs. And she's hysterical. She's not making any sense. And she's got the word boy carved in her arm. And from there, it seems obvious she did that herself. How much analysis is going on of the other stuff? Who cares? At that point, it's like, I want to care for my patient. Let's go and get her some help. Because whether these happened uh, by her or by somebody else, this, he concluded, happened by her. 
Send her up to the hospital. Get her the treatment he needs. That's the 20 minutes. I appreciate that he had that opinion and his reason was because he wanted to help her. But think of it in that context. He doesn't get information after the fact. He doesn't get the pictures later. He doesn't get the marks that show the, the puncture wounds later. He doesn't get to see the clothes. He doesn't read the journals. He doesn't see the other, um, the scene. He doesn't see any of the other evidence. That's consistent with him cutting her. He's cutting her. Her beliefs are reasonable. He's not letting her out, right? And that's, again, even if mistaken, there's a fight. It's in the back seat of a car. There's not a lot of space. The door's open. There's one way out. She's trying to get out that door. Maybe he's trying to get out that door. Maybe he's not. I don't know. But two people in a small space, they're going to be bumping, hitting, going up against each other. If her belief is, he's not letting me out. Because she's, as she said, I think at one point, she's freaking out. As well as she should. She's in the backseat of a car with a guy with a knife who's maybe just trying to use this as knife play in a sex thing, but she's not into that today. Don't want that today. Because I'll tell you this, and I think the state might come up here and say that, consent in November isn't consent in March. Consent in no December isn't consent in March. Consent in January isn't consent in March. Consent in February isn't consent in March. It is disrespectful and disturbing. There are other objectives. States never argued. I don't know consent. what they're going to argue. This is argument, Judge. I can make argument. Well, I, I can make argument just like you can make argument. It's just, I'm overruled. Just go ahead. But I don't believe that the state made that argument. If they get up here and make that argument, the implication through questions was she wasn't afraid before. She's agreed to this before. She liked prone position before. If the implication was there, that's not consent on March 22nd. Any person, doesn't matter their gender, gets to decide that on an individual day. And she, they're in the small space. He's got a knife. She tries to get out. He's not getting out of the way. She talks about, in her statement, how she tried to scoot around through the side. Her beliefs are reasonable, even if mistaken. He's not letting her out. Another reason. Alex is strangling her. We've seen the neck mark, right? I showed you the mark on the neck. She says he's got his hand up against her. He's pushing her head up against the back of the, the car seat. Remember the car seat where the hat was? And there's, there's uh, punctures in the back of the, the, um, the rear of the seat from a knife. Right? She's got the knife. She's trying to get out. He's not letting her out. He's holding her there. She can't breathe. That's a reasonable belief at that point to say, you know what? I got to get out of here. If he gets the knife, it's over. I can't get it. I can't get it back. That's a reasonable belief. Reasonable belief, another one. He's up and moving. I talked about this before. If he's up and moving outside of the scene, He's out in front of the, the uh, at marker 15, out by the front tire. He's alongside the other parts of it. He's up and moving. He's mobile. He's capable of doing all of that stuff. Then it's certainly a reasonable to belief to say, I haven't stopped him yet. He's still moving when he's inside the car and they're fighting. That's a reasonable belief. And the type of wounds, right? They're going to talk over and over and over, like the amount of force that this was. And they're gonna say 16, all right? But let's, let's break this down a little bit. One of them is to the finger, and they don't know when or where, it's just, there's three to the neck, but I think all of the experts said it could have been three, it could have been one, depending upon that dynamic process, all right? And then even Dr. Mills in her testimony Even Dr. Mills in her testimony A few of them deeper, correct. Most shallower, yes. Most soft tissue, yes. So the amount of force on most of those, on most of those, they weren't that deep. They weren't that hard. There wasn't a lot of force. 
which makes sense because if she's not stabbing hard enough, he can still fight back, and he is still fighting back. And what her testimony was is, look, I don't remember. I remember at some point a neck, and I remember the head, and it all stopped when it was the, over at the head, which makes sense, right? But that's the reasonable belief part of it, is the number doesn't matter if he's still moving, if he's still attacking. She believes that he's still attacking. That makes it reasonable. The belief of her is reasonable, right? And while we're talking about his wounds, let me just say, this abrasion to his knee that we talked about before, about the back seat of the car, there's no testimony. If the state gets up here and tries to argue that that happened after death, post-mortem in some sort of attempt to drag him or something, first off, there's no evidence to support that at all. There's no evidence of that at all. His injuries, even despite that, he's still up and moving. Her testimony was she left, I think it's on page 54 of the, and she saw, said he was not moving anymore once he's down on the ground. She left, she stopped, right? She thought he was dead. She left, she didn't go back to, to stab him anymore. Now I know we have the stab outside of the car, right? There's the fight inside the car and then he gets out and he wanders around and she sits at the edge of the seat and he's there. And the state says, well that makes no sense with what Dr. Hopper says, but their analogy was, is this if it's a lion? Nobody's saying he's a lion. This is a human being. This is a human being that she cared for, that she had a relationship with, that she wanted to go and talk to so that she could see if they could sort some stuff out. Some stuff happened in the back seat that's horrible, that's horrendous, that nobody wanted to happen, she didn't want to happen. But then when he said, I need to help, I want to pee, I need to pee, I need to go to the bathroom, the amygdala is not there now. Things have now stopped. It's a different. And she reaches out to go and help him. She gets scared again, whether he's grabbing her to pull her down or whether he's grabbing her because he's going to fall down. It's reasonable for her to believe, oh no, it's all happening again. And as she says, she's in close to him and she reaches around and stabs him one last time. That's what her testimony was. She's going to make up some story. Why would she say that? Why would she talk about that? She'd initially told the police, Investigator Proc, right away, stuff happened in the car, I got out, I got scared, I reached around, I stabbed him. I think she said in the side, right? Whether that's on the left side or on the back side. But she left before knowing because she stopped when she had to stop. Two other things. The reasonableness of this you can consider. Post-traumatic stress disorder. The judges said you can consider that in deciding the reasonableness of her beliefs. And what you heard from the experts and was uncontested is that's who she is. Under those circumstances at that time, we're talking about a 20-year-old woman with PTSD. Whether she had it in that moment, I guess I can't exactly say. But childhood onset trauma, he does say. Aspects of depersonalization, he does say. You can consider that in deciding a person under those circumstances. What would their reasonable belief be? What would her reasonable belief be at that time under that condition? And then what we know is Dr. Hopper's testimony about defense circuitry, right? What happens when the, the stress happens and there's a response and the defense circuitry goes on and the amygdala takes over and you're doing reflexes or habits. Her initial habits, her initial habits are to not fight back, are to freeze, to lay still, to let this happen. She doesn't say she's getting cut up, or she doesn't say she's fighting when she's getting cut up. She says she's laying there. She's laying there. And then at some point it's like, 
Oh, <clears throat> and it changes, right? She gets cut near her vagina, and it changes. She says she rolls over, pulls her right leg over to protect herself, exposing her right outside of her hip. When it gets punctures, she starts fighting back, kneeing, kicking, right? That's the defense circuitry. And in that situation, it's not as if you're rationally thinking. Any person under that situation, that's what Dr. Hopper said, anybody, short of a Navy SEAL, certainly there's no evidence that this 20-year-old vulnerable woman had any training whatsoever. She's under those situations, under those circumstances, <coughs> at that time, those beliefs are reasonable. On day two, I told you about a young lady who ran to a farmer's house and rang the bell over and over and over again. Now a farmer from our community opened the door, brought her in, found a chair, made a call, got her a blanket. She'd been hyperventilating, she'd been crying, she'd been sobbing. You know, Remember his words, something along the lines of, looked like she'd been through a lot. He didn't judge her based upon his, her character. He had no legal obligation to give her the benefit of the doubt. But sometimes, perhaps the best among us out there in the world, on a day-to-day -day basis, are able to give the benefit of a doubt to another human being. And in that situation, Don Sipple did that. He brought her in. He did his moral obligation. He protected her. He took care of her. He gave her the benefit of a doubt. Now here she is, in front of you. She fought for her life once. She's asking you to do your duty. You only get one chance to do your duty. So go back there. Think about the case. Use care, caution, rationale. Remember what I told you about how you can use the evidence so that when you leave and you hand in that verdict form, one verdict form that says not guilty and one of you amongst you gets to take and sign that form and submit it to the judge and you go home and you put your head on that pillow tonight, tomorrow, sometime, right? And you wake up the next morning, and you do like probably all of us do, right? You wander into the bathroom at some point, you rub the sand out of your eyes, as they say, and you look in the mirror. And you can be proud, proud American, to say, I did my duty. I followed the law. 
And when this young lady had a fight for her life, and she was in trial and attacked again and again and again, you analyze that evidence and you see she was acting in self-defense. You know, there's a saying, I'm sure I'm going to misquote it, but I'll paraphrase. Our communities are often judged by how we in the community treat those who are the oldest among us or the youngest among us, or the weak, or the vulnerable. This is our community. Don Sipple is a part of our community. She's innocent. She's fighting for her life, acting in self-defense. She's innocent. She's one of the 